excited to be here to announce the uh, UDL talks this morning. So, uh, you know, kind of like Brian Dean, we, we can't match Brian Dean, right, for hype. But uh, in the someone like me, uh, anyone who's wearing a wizard or witch hat, stand up today. <laughs> All right, let's give a round of applause. <laughs> so this morning, uh, the first UDL talk that we have uh, is going to be a special treat. I know that many of you read the description in the program and were uh, probably very engaged. If many of you are Harry Potter fans like I am, you're thinking, wow, this could be tremendously exciting. And I guarantee you it will. We, uh, we actually have a witch and wizard that will be up here. Uh, so our witch, uh, who actually was, uh, apparently I learned this morning, uh, told she was a witch through bedtime stories by her father, and she can tell you more about that personally, uh, is Lisa Beth Carey. Uh, actually, got to take my glasses off. You know how when you get old, you got you to adjust your vision? Uh, Lisa is a senior education consultant at the Center for Innovation and Leadership in Special Education. Is it Silsey? Uh, at Kennedy Krieger Institute and a Cass Cadre member. Lisa was part of Silsey's first fellowship cohort, where she studied neuroscience, behavior science, school law, and scientific inquiry with faculty at Kennedy Krieger Institute and Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Wow, that's, that's a lot. Uh, Lisa serves as a bridge between researchers, clinicians, and educators, translating advances in cognitive sciences to actionable practices within the classroom. So that's the key, right? The actionable practices within the classroom. Prior to joining Silsey, Lisa served as a special educator in Baltimore County and St. Mary's County, Maryland, where she specialized in inclusive practices. Lisa has facilitated UDL implementation projects in several school systems and states. She received a BA in history from St. Mary's College in Maryland, a master's in teaching with certification in special education and social studies education from Goucher College, and a school administrator certificate from Towson University, which correspondingly was the site of our last uh, UDL IRN summit. She also served as an adjunct faculty at St. Mary's College of Maryland and Towson University, covering topics of exceptionality and UDL, Lisa is currently a doctoral student in instructional technology at Towson University, where she's focused on the improvement of pre-service and in-service training and supports for teachers. So Lisa, thank you. And I have another person to announce because she's co-doing this with our wizard here, John Mundorf. John, also named uh, not Mundorf, but Fundorf. Is that okay if I say that, right? John Fundorf. Uh, is the award-winning National Board Certified 7th grade English Language Arts teacher at P.K. Young Development Research School at the University of Florida. Dr. Mundorf ensures, enjoys sharing his experiences with others and has done so at conferences and workshops around the world. He consults with schools, school districts, universities, and other organizations on topics such as inclusive teacher pedagogy, accessibility, technology integration, practitioner research, school improvement, and of course, universal design for learning. He's a member of the Harvard Graduate School of Education UDL Summer Institute faculty and the CAST UDL faculty cadre. He has an educational doctorate in curriculum and instruction from the University of Florida, a master's in education in curriculum and instruction from Florida Gulf Coast University, who apparently was uh, not representing in the NCAA as well as they have in the past. I know some people that picked them to win it all as the upset candidate this year, but uh, they didn't quite make it this year, but that's all right. Uh, and a BS in elementary uh, education at Bowling Green State University, which John, I need to talk to you about because my son is about to go there next year. Yeah. So to the stage, please everybody, round of applause for Lisa Beth Carey and John Mundorf.
Well, good morning, everybody. Hello. So it's official. We've been accepted to present at an international conference. And in our program description that we submitted, we called ourselves a witch and a wizard. And since it was accepted and we're here in front of you. We are now internationally recognized witch and wizard. Yes. So that happened today, which is kind of exciting. Thank you. <laughs> we are thrilled to talk with you about uh, two topics that we care about very deeply, uh, in no particular order, Universal Design for Learning and Harry Potter. Um, Lisa and I have had the opportunity um, to, in a number of occasions, uh, visit uh, schools and school districts all over the place. New York City, Baltimore, Boston, Houston, Chicago, Columbus, Indiana, um, are all places where we've had the wonderful pleasure of being able to work with schools, school district leaders, teachers on UDL implementation. We're not going to tell you about those visits today, though, because recently we had the wonderful opportunity to travel to the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry to implement Universal Design for Learning. So today, we're going to share with you a little bit about that journey and lessons we learned from our visits to Hogwarts. You've been warned. <laughs> You've been warned. We, uh, as you may imagine, have had a little bit of fun preparing for this. We've scaled back our first draft, which was probably around 150 slides. It would have taken three days. Yes. However, we have submitted a request to the IRN to allow us to have um, a conference running parallel to this conference next year um, that's entirely about Harry Potter. So we'll let you know if that happens. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, uh, the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry is a private school. The funding source is a bit unknown. Located uh, in England that serves witches and wizards in the United Kingdom. The school has been in existence since the 19, or 900s, so for over a, a thousand years, and educates students on the campus of Hogwarts beginning at age 11, up until they graduate from Hogwarts as certified witches and wizards. Any questions about Hogwarts, we're happy to answer later on, especially if you're not as familiar. Um, but what we'd like to do now is talk a little bit about the journey, our trip to Hogwarts, and lessons about UDL impl implementation that came as a result. So when we go to any school, there are different cultures that we encounter, different school cultures. And this brings us to our first lesson, which is that school culture affects a school's willingness to explore UDL. So some schools we enter are hungry for UDL. We want change, we want to make an impression on our students, we want to unlock their potential, and this is the way we're going to do it. Some schools are just dipping their toe in, I'm going to try out UDL, we'll see how this goes. And other schools you walk in and you wonder why anyone invited you to be there. You're getting the side eye. Like, we are excellent. And Hogwarts has a storied tradition. It's been around since the 900s. Many famous witches and wizards have graduated from there and gone on to do wonderful things, sometimes terrible things, but amazingly terrible things. And so they are very good, at least in their mind, at preparing young witches and wizards to be excellent. And so although we were invited to come, many of the faculty were confused about why they should ever need to change we are, after all, exceptional, is what they told us. And so when faced with a school that is hesitant to change, you have to start thinking about what messaging would be most important for them to hear. And we have to address the variability that exists within the mindsets of the faculty members and the other community members within the school. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on, but that school culture piece is just so important to address as you're walking into a school. Unfortunately, sometimes we get the wrong message before we show up, right? We're invited, yes, we're doing UDL and this is going to be amazing, and then you show up and nobody wants to change. Um, luckily, we are magical, and so we make them change. <laughs> but 
people need to buy into the message and they need time to buy in and they need time to explore. And so even if you walk into a building or you're a new teacher to a school system and you want UDL to be there and to be part of that experience, it might take time, but it's never impossible. So upon arrival at Hogwarts, one of the first things that we noticed was the moving staircases. They're everywhere. Um, the magic of the building is quite impressive. However, as we walked around, we recognized that for all the wonderful moving staircases, uh, magically designed, we couldn't find a single ramp anywhere in the entire place. Or an elevator. Which got us thinking about physical environment, right? So there's all this magic present, right? The ability to design the building in any way that they would like to. However, they're not considering accessibility from the beginning. So when we think about UDL implementation, a key piece is considering the variability that's present within your space, not only as it relates to physical access, but also the types of materials that you're using in classrooms. Um, just like any other school that we've visited, books are a big part of the Hogwarts educational experience. Books abound. There, there are libraries all over Hogwarts, and every classroom has core textbooks. They even have books that are animals that will eat you, that will try to bite you. Which is not reducing your threats and distractions whatsoever. Not at all. However, as much as we looked around, we couldn't find any books that embedded some level of text to speech. Minerva McGonagall can change herself from a cat into a person, but for some reason, no one at Hogwarts was thinking about the accessibility of the text that students were asked to consume on a regular basis. So the second UDL implementation is that without intentional design for variability present within your school, that you're never, ever going to meet the needs of all of your learners. You want to see if your wand works? I dropped it earlier. Click and swish. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> so our third lesson brings us back to that variability piece. Now, all learners are variable, which we know. Um, and when you're going into a school to implement UDL, the faculty are also the learners. And so we're going to talk now about some of the students and some of the faculty because we wanted to know what everyone was doing in that space. And so we did some learning walks. Um, we did some ghost walks. It was definitely the first time I'd done a ghost walk with some actual ghosts. Um, but we went from classroom to classroom and we really spent time with the students and the teachers. And what we found was that there was a lot of variability that wasn't being addressed and that everyone was kind of being treated as if they should just fit this mold of being a Hogwarts student, that there was a way to do that. And so our third lesson has to do with asking questions about our assumptions about learning and learners and then addressing whatever those questions reveal about how we as a school feel about those things. So the first person I want to talk about is Neville Longbottom. So Neville has anxiety. He's very anxious. He has some trauma in his past, um, so it makes sense that he's got anxiety. Sometimes he gets so nervous that he falls over or he makes mistakes. Um, he has had trouble, especially in his potions class, where he seems to get the most anxious. Um, where he is in an environment where things are a little calmer and more supportive, like in his herbology class, he does tend to do better. But when he is with Professor Snape in his potions class, he gets so nervous that he sometimes blows things up. Um, and what was really interesting was that in that environment, rather than being supportive of the student that everyone is aware of his family history and the things that have happened to him and the fact that he is very anxious, rather than assisting him, some of the faculty members actually join in on the bullying that's been occurring in the classroom. Um, so we were concerned that the students' backgrounds and their barriers to learning weren't being addressed. Now, the next person I want to talk about is Hermione Granger. She is considered the brightest witch of her age. She is definitely a gifted young witch. Um, but rather than challenge her with more rigorous work or in have her investigate projects and do re research on her own, the answer to Hermione needs more was to just load her with extra classes. So many classes that she actually needs to go back in time occasionally to be able to attend two classes at once, 
which is helpful if you have a magical time turner, but not really the best solution for someone who needs extension and deeper rigor. The next person I wanna talk about is Ron. Ron seems to struggle with attention. He's definitely having some trouble with writing tasks especially. He has a lot of trouble organizing, um, but he is smart and creative and fun and definitely is the kind of person you want to have with you on an adventure. He will sacrifice himself on a giant chessboard should you ask him to. But he needs some assistance. And where is he getting it? His friends, not the faculty, but his friends. In fact, he tried to provi provide himself with some accommodations. He purchased a uh, self-spelling quill, but he was informed that that was cheating and it was against school rules. And then the quill wound up not working very well either, which goes back to the whole thing with, if you have magic, why does the quill not work? <laughs> so, the, st the stairs move, but the quill doesn't work. <laughs> so these students all have variable needs but they're all treated like they should be meeting the same exact expectations and learning in the exact same way. Now, the faculty also have different learning needs. So we have Professor McGonigal who's very strict and traditional, but she is very passionate about her students. And so having conversations with her really had to do with the relationship she has for her students, the passion she has for them to succeed and to become the best witches and wizards they can be. That was very different in the conversations that we had with Professor Snape, who really doesn't have any relationships with his students, has been known to smack them on the head, who told them that he could help them brew power and bottle success and love only if they're not as dumb as he thinks they are. No professor who tells you that they expect you to fail is going to get your best work. And so we had to talk about what does it mean to have students be successful and what do we have to do to get them there because his goal, his focus was success and mastery. And so he was a content specialist that we had to work on building relationships with. So this moves us into UDL implementation lesson number four from our visit to Hogwarts. And this builds upon lesson number three. This is the idea that all learners, including teachers and students, need varying levels of support and challenge. And that's all going to depend on the goal or the context. All learners need options for why they learn, options for what they learn, and options for how they learn. In this class, you see a lesson where students are being asked to levitate a feather in the air. Hermione has it figured out right away. Ron is lost. Seamus blew it up. As we look at UDL implementation, a common mistake that is made is the UDL work focuses on either Seamus or Ron because they may be struggling. But when we think about universal design for learning, we need to expand our thinking beyond just a student who might be struggling to all the learners in the space. And as our conference tagline is this week, universal design for learning is learning designed for everyone, including the faculty of the staff that you're working with. Now, it was a terrific first visit to Hogwarts. And like all of our visits, we look forward to follow-up visits because one of the things that we have learned over the years is that a single visit to teach someone about universal design for learning is never enough. In fact, if in your plan is to bring somebody in to talk about UDL once, and then you'll be doing UDL, it's not going to go very well. We informed Hogwarts of that, and they're looking forward to us, to, to us returning again. We've already sent them some agenda items that we're going to be adding to the list. Um, the first has to do with the sorting hat. We want to talk a little bit about the sorting hat, the benefits of having a sorting hat, dividing students into houses. Or do we need to start questioning it a little bit? By saying a student is a Hufflepuff that has certain characteristics, are we limiting them in their thinking about their own learning and their own development? Or do we need to be more flexible in the housing structure at Hogwarts? Another one is Quidditch. Everyone's talking about Quidditch. But one of the things that we were wondering is, is that the only extracurricular activity that takes place at Hogwarts? There's and not even a chess club. Yeah, where's the chess club? 
And what do all the other students do that don't play Quidditch? So we felt that Hogwarts could do a much better job as make, of making their extracurricular activities more inclusive. And then finally, and probably the biggest concern that we had during our visit to Hogwarts was really thinking about the inclusivity of the school. As we walked around Hogwarts, there were wonderful students and wonderful faculty, but we kept questioning, is the Hogwarts student population really represent, representative of the students that live in the United Kingdom? Where are the witches and wizards with hearing impairment? Where were the witches and wizards in wheelchairs? Where were the witches and wizard, wizards with visual impairment? So one of the things that we're gonna push on next is when we talk about being a school that's trying to meet the needs of all learners, are we really talking about all learners? So some of these stories may feel familiar to you if you've already been on a journey. And if you are just starting out on your journey, just know that implementation is a thing that we all share in common, but all of our stories are a bit unique. So while you might not be at a private school that has a lot of accolades, um, you might still face some of the same barriers. You might not be working with a potions instructor, but you might have someone who's so focused on their content that they miss out on forming relationships with their students. And so the important piece of all of this is that as we go through our, impl our own implementation stories, that we share those stories with each other, that we network and learn from each other, because I think that we can group problem solve and address a lot of these barriers to implementation. And if there's anything that Harry Potter has taught us is that it doesn't matter how brave you are or smart, you need your squad. You need <laughs> Dumbledore's army. You need your Order of the Phoenix. And so you need to get your squad together and get ready to make changes for all students. And, and most importantly, don't let the muggles get you down. <laughs> Despite the challenges at Hogwarts, one of the things that was clearly revealed is that in talking with the leadership of the school, the desire and understanding about the importance of choice and options and flexibility was very clear. And so everyone has the potential to incorporate universal design for learning into their work. It's just a matter of being really strategic about what that implementation looks like. We thank you very much for your time. Have a great day.